in the study of equivariant volumes. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a bit different topic today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is, uh, this would be the topic about, uh, I don't know how to say it. Maybe the best name would be Polishuk A infinity structure. And uh, chiral fields. So, um, so what? Uh, so what I'm going to do today? So what I actually did? I kind of simplified Polishuk uh, considerations, uh, and 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 also they could be considered they could be generalized in the way how I might modify them and they are doable. And uh, actually I would not say something like this is like this, this is like that. So we would be added to, we would be able to compute things just on the board. Okay. So, uh, so I assume more uh, involvement of the audience. And uh, this would be the first example of mirror symmetry for open strings. And I would say in formulas. Also, we will see explicit infinity structure and we will see how one can modify it and generalize it in different ways mm -hmm. so let me start with some preliminaries so my plan would be first i'll remind equations for a infinity coming from string theory. Point number B would be, I also, I already mentioned it, but here I'd like to repeat it. Some example. So called rational example. Okay, alpha, beta, gamma. I will describe a model example. It would be trigonometric. A alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Then I'll describe the mirror and it would be chiral fermion, no, chiral field. And uh, the lesson that we can get from this is that uh, this could be generalized. And when we generalize it, we will see how chiral field should work, should look uh, in general. And also we will discuss the formations. Okay, so... Uh, so some uh, points I would I would leave open, but uh, I want to say that everything. So here all computations you can do 
without uh, knowledge of high math. All computations here would be elementary. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you can not only follow them, by, by, but you can do them yourself. Okay? While uh, it would involve some uh, fancy walls like, I don't know, holomorphic disks bounded on Lagrangians and manifolds. Okay, they are not that fancy, but uh, everything would be explicit. So uh, I just checked. So Polishuk is uh, sp is apparently spelled with I. So it's not it's not like many shuk. But you see, these four letters. Yes. Shuk. Shuk. Yes. Ah. Also, from this. Uh, I'll say you in words uh, how to reconstruct uh, a ring of functions from the category. That should replace manifold uh, in modern mathematics. Okay. So not only computational or physical lessons, but also some mathematical lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first, where a infinity comes from. A infinity comes from the following idea. Suppose uh, you have uh, a disk. So now it's a disk. And you have marked points on the bound. So what people say about these disks and marked points, they say that here we have boundary conditions, B1, B2, etc., Bn. And these boundary conditions on the segments you consider as an object in category. And here you have uh, defect, something marked. And the vector space that you put here <clears throat> may be considered as a morphism from uh, adjacent boundary conditions. Then you pick up one point, say this point, and say that it is an output. You integrate over the space M not, not, n plus one. Correlator of vertex operators. And you understand it as a map from V1, Vn, to Vn plus 1. This integral. So here, 0 means genus 0. This 0 means no marked points. In the bulk. N plus one means N plus one marked points on the boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, <clears throat> people, so we heard that when we have. Uh, infinity structure, there are some relations among operations. Mm -hmm. So these relations 
typically are coming from the following uh, boundary in this space. You just pinch disk somewhere. And then disk decomposes into two disks. So sum of all these pinchings of a disk is a boundary. You see, I draw these lines in order to distinguish disks from the spheres. So mm -hmm. when you draw it like this, it means it's, it's a disk. Okay, <clears throat> then the question is uh, the following. So we know that M003 is a point. So what kind uh, of relations do we expect to have? Suppose we have four points, three incoming, one outgoing. <clears throat> there are two possible pinchings, this one and this one. I'll pull, call these points one, two, three. One, two, three. So first boundary corresponds to two, three. Sorry. One, something outgoing. And the second boundary corresponds to One, two, three, something outgoing. So actually, here you have operation M2, two inputs, and this will, of course, will be an output. And here you also have M2. And if, if there would be such M2, it is called associativity. So one has to be careful about the sign. I am not careful about the sign. Okay, uh, so we know it. Not that interesting, very standard. But just imagine that M2 is identically zero. What kind of structure should we assume to get? So let me show you an interesting example of such structure. So what would be if there would be only M3? Do we have M1? No. No? No, only M3. Mm -hmm. And no differential of any kind? No differential of any kind. Mm -hmm. So let us play the game. So how many points, so the question, how many points should we put on the boundary of a disk to get only M3 and M3 is the result? Um, 
So remember, we started with four points. After pinching, we get M2 and M2. So we need six points then. We need six points. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five. Here is the sixth point. Now, how many ways we could separate this big disk into two small disks to get composition? Remember, we should get only M3. It means that this yeah. is of no use. So there are three ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. This way, this way, and this way. Mm -hmm. Three ways. So it will be a relation that would involve three terms, right? Mm -hmm. So let us consider this first, first way. Output, and then I go one, two, three, all together, four, five. So here we have M3, here we have M3. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, plus two other terms. Mm -hmm. If you don't like disks, you may deform it. into equations like this. So these are M3. You just need to consider it fair. Okay. So it is good to consider them fat in order to trace object. So each object is somewhere here. So it's interesting that he that in this diagram we seem to have uh, objects that were not original objects. So what was the number of original objects? Six. Or we or we do. We do. So we do. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the number of objects is the same. However, here. <laughs> We start to have morphisms. Okay, so objects are the same morphisms that we never encountered that we that we didn't encounter from the beginning. Okay. Now, you may think, what could be these mysterious three term relations? You may start to think, had you ever met such relations? And the answer is yes. There is the simplest three term relation. So I call it one over A minus B. You may look, you may ask what what does it mean? I so M3 should be an operation from three V's to another V. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
So if these V's are just one dimensional, if all these V's are one dimensional, the, the operation is uh, a number, multiplication. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if they are not one dimensional, this would be decorated. But I will promise to give you the simplest example, okay? Of course, you may ask how for objects encode two numbers. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So you will see later, but just imagine. So what? So, uh, so Andrei, I guess I, I, I'm puzzled by, by the setup. So, I mean, on one side, you're talking about construction in infinity algebra. So that's just a vector space together with some operations. And on the other hand, you, you start talking about, about objects. And that sounds more like you're talking about infinity uh, categories. Okay. So it's infinity categories. But then uh, I, I guess I, I don't know uh, well enough what it should be. So, uh, so oh, okay. then uh, is not so a... Please, please don't worry about... Uh, so then V is uh, not a vector uh, space endowed with operations. Okay. So you see, uh, you can always uh, make a category in algebra if it has finitely many objects. You just sum all of them. Mm. So if there, are, if there are now no morphisms from one object to another object, you consider this space as a null space. I don't understand. I don't understand. Okay. So, so what is the algebra? Algebra, in, the, in some sense, is category with one object. And you okay. can compose. So this is category with one object. So suppose there are there is a category with two objects okay mm -hmm. so there are things like this things like this also morphisms so here you know how to multiply arrows mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. here you may say that you don't know how to multiply arrows if the end of one arrow is not the beginning of another Yes. So in this case, you may easily set the result of this multiplication to be equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So just uh, join these two things, in, consider these two objects as a single object, and consider these as arrows. Uh, allowing uh, sometimes uh, arrows to be multiplied with the, where the result is a zero. After all, it's an algebra. Mm. So actual distinction between this and this, uh, from my point of view, comes from the place where we have infinitely many objects. And it is hard to put them all together in the same object when you are thinking about uh, the finiteness of some mm -hmm. spaces. But it's not the, the, the case that you want to see right now. So right now, uh, just think about A infinity category just as a kind of A infinity algebra. Mm -hmm. I would like to add a comment on that. Uh, yes. In many categories, the geometry categories we encounter in symplectic or algebraic geometry usually have a generator. I mean, the single object that governs everything. So if you take the endomorphism algebra of the generator, you can safely think categories as an algebra. So basically, you can do that all the time. 
no problem. Well, I, I, I agree. I didn't understand that also. So I also didn't hear it. So we, we, we have a, a what in the category? I mean, for example, if you start with like uh, proper smooth algebraic varieties mm -hmm. and consider its drive categories or mm -hmm. uh, nice and packing manifolds, complex and packing manifolds uh, and its Fukaya category, mm -hmm. then there are a single object which generates that category which means that the home space to that object, to any other object, is never empty. So in a sense, it meets every other object. Mm -hmm. That's a concept of generators. Mm -hmm. So if you have a single or maybe finite collection of such generating objects, and you collect them all and consider their endomorphism algebra, then the category is equivalent to the module categories of that endomorphism algebra. So we can replace the original category to the category of modules of certain algebras. No, yeah, that, that, that's nice, but I guess I would need to understand examples to uh, how does it actually work. So right uh, now, So what, what, what are those generating objects, I don't know, for either Fukaya or, di or direct uh, here in Chiefs or, yeah, I guess I just need, need so some mm -hmm. I think Andre gives you an example of Fukaya category. So uh, I'll, I'll briefly describe uh, the drive categories of projective space. Uh, the generating object uh, is, would, uh, the one of the choice of the generating object is the sum of all ON with n positive integers. Sum so of, of what? Uh, I mean, the Sarah twisting sheep O1, and it's all multiples. The sum of all, all OKs with K non-positive, uh, non-negative integers. Mm -hmm. Then the single one generates the whole category, and then you can mm -hmm. consider it's endomorphism algebra. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think that is uh, not far from this homogeneous polynomial algebras, which gives you a description of drive categories of PN, yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so uh, you see, this would be an exercise in algebraic geometry. But before, you see, before somebody starts doing this exercise, it is good to see the answer. Oh, uh, yes, of course. So uh, it is interesting that, yes, exactly. It's, in the, it's just in, in this CP1 category, but the answer I'd like to say is one. Here I have A minus B. Here I have B minus C plus B minus C, C minus A plus one, C minus A, A minus B. So here you have nice collection. So you see here we have three terms. You can add them together and see that it is zero because here we have A minus B, B minus C. So it is like C minus A. This is of course A minus B. And this is, of course, B minus C. So if you add these things, you get zero. Mm -hmm. So this is a simple computation that one can make. And uh, this is a rational example of uh, A infinity structure that has only M3. OK? It's interesting. Such complicated look. Uh, so such complicated thing with such a simple answer. Okay. Well, uh, again, I, I see the formula, and uh, it's it's a trivial formula or simple formula, but uh, but I don't know how is it an infinity structure. And again, I, I, infinity structure in which sense? So I guess you are talking about infinity category, not infinity algebra. Then what are these letters A, B, C? What are those things? Ah. 
Okay. So you may ask, what are these letters? Okay. Yes. So actually, okay. So actually, these letters are uh, moduli of uh, objects. And uh, in uh, this particular example, so uh, this I say without uh, derivation. They are so I, I can make a mistake. So I have so I should have three objects and uh, okay, I'll I'll better write them like this on the sphere. So, one, two, three. So actually, so I can make a misprint. So actually this object could be say O of N. This object would be skyscraper at point A. This object would be, I think, O of n plus one. You see, I can make a mistake in these n's, and this would be sky skyscraper at uh, point B. So two skyscrapers, they are parameterized by A and B, and. Uh, and uh, two light bundles parameterized by their first gen class. Now, now there are morphisms. There is unique morphism from O of N to O of A. It's called the uh, home. Or people sometimes call it x to zero. From O A to O N plus one, there is also a unique thing that is called x to one. And here you also have x to one. So, Andrei, frankly, I'm just very scared now. So you you are writing some words I don't know their meaning. And. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. Okay, so so the thing that is O of A mm -hmm. is uh, nothing but a shift that has uh, that is concentrated that has a section concentrated at the point. No, that doesn't scare me. What you wrote at the points scares scares me. Ah, so uh, so I so in order to do so in order to do this, okay. You need to re you need to uh, replace this O of A as a complex of two vector bundles and the section. This uh, this would be the only section that uh, has zero at point A. So here we have comp uh, two, oh. two complex like O uh, O M plus one O M. So what goes where? O M goes here by multiplication by Z minus A. Uh, so the vector space is the space of uh, holomorphic sections of this. Yes, exactly, exactly. So here we have degree M polynomial. And here we have degree m plus one polynomial. You can put this here by multiplying by, by z minus a. Actually, you should write it as homogeneous coordinates. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, when you when you do it this way, you have uh, so you, you you consider cohomology here, and it will be just this k square half. So you so you factor this by the image of this. Mm -hmm. Now, what you have here? Uh, here you have. Uh, polynomials, here homogeneous, here we have homogeneous polynomials. Then the map between this space and this space, of course, there are two, band, two maps, and there are the differentials here. Mm -hmm. So you compute cohomology of this space. And, you'll, and this, and this uh, cohomology is called X with the star. So it is, uh, it is it is called derived uh, from home. Home would be just maps, and here we have so, maps with so, the right. So Andrei, if we are doing this example, so I'm sorry. For, uh, if if you want to explain this to me, then then let's do it in detail because I, I just don't know this. Uh, I, it it would be useful for me to do it in detail. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll start doing it in detail because. Mm -hmm. uh, because computation uh, takes takes some uh, some time, but still, I am trying to explain. Mm -hmm. So O of A, so mm -hmm. I can make a mistake, but uh, you consider O M. You consider O, okay, M plus one O M. I think it was it was kind of uh, very reasonable what you said about yeah resolution of of a but now for now for the for the morphism so that that's something that you said okay. very quickly. Okay, now suppose we also have o, have o n. You mm -hmm. want to understand what should be the morphisms from this space to this space. Mm -hmm. And uh, just imagine that you don't know morphisms between bundles and shifts. You want to redefine them somehow. Mm -hmm. So how do you redefine the space of morphisms? First, you consider space of morphisms to this complex. So actually, you have uh, some morphism F1 and some morphism F2. Mm -hmm. But this pair of, of morphisms that is a morphism between this thing and this uh, complex is actually a complex itself because it has a differential. What, what, is, what is a complex itself? So this was a complex. Yes. So when you have a mor morphism to a complex, the morphisms to a complex also become complexes. Okay, yeah. And here we have a differential. You see, since everything is homogeneous, it will be much better to write it like Z naught A naught plus Z one A one in order to show that uh, you keep homogeneity. Mm -hmm. And A is the ratio of uh, this to A. So you, you, you have, so you have uh, morphism here, you have morphism here. So, so these morphisms are just multiplications by polynomials. And on the space of these morphisms, you have a differential. So if you call this pi, then the differential is, of course, something like, what can you do? So if you say that this is multiplication by polynomials, then in particular, if m is smaller than m, then there is no, there are no yes, morphisms. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is how you make this differential on the space of F1, F2. Mm -hmm. 
So this is, as you see, it is adjoint, okay? What is adjoint? By adjoint, I mean that if you have something here and you have differential here, you have differential on the space of maps. Mm -hmm. yes. so, 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 so that's what yes. I call adjoint. Actually, would there be, would I have here another differential, internal differential? I will put the difference between these two differentials. However, in this model, here differential is exactly zero. Okay, and then you, and then you compute cohomology of this. And then you see in which degree you land. If you land in one degree, you call it X zero. If you land in another degree, you call it X one. There is no more, there is no choice. So that's how you define the vector spaces that you go to scatter, sorry, that you go to correlate. And then you have to proceed. Because now this was just what X is. Now you have to define the following thing. You have to define composition of X. Of course you can do it because uh, since objects are made out of uh, something where you know what composition is actually from holomorphic sections of the vector bundle. You know how to compose that. So, not only on the space of cohomologies, you have multiplication. On the space of morphisms between uh, objects, you have composition. So, uh, just to know this fancy word, this fancy word is called Home. So actually, if object one is a complex of, of vector bundles, okay, how to say it? If object two, so it's a complex, and here we have differential, object two is also a collection of vector bundles. And here we have differential D2. The space of maps is called Gerhom. And it is equipped with the adjoint differential. Uh, that part of the board is not visible. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is called, so this is Gerhom. Objects are complex, morphisms between objects are also complex. Now, if you have three objects, 
So, so there is a so Gerhom, Gerhom itself is a complex. Okay, mm -hmm. because uh, because it's space of maps between complexes, so it's a complex with a joint differential. Mm -hmm. Now, consider object one, object two, and object three. Here we have Gerhom one two. Here we have Gerhom two three. There is a composition. So in the simplest case, composition brings you Gerho one three. But then we can go to cohomology, and as a result, you get operation M2. But now, you can play even better. Suppose there are four objects, one, two, three, four. So you have Gerhom one, two, two, three, three, four. So here you can define the messy operation. So you you compose these two things. Now you take homotopy D13. Minus one. Here you compose. Plus. One, two, two, three, three, four. Plus, you can do it this way. Here we take D to four minus one, homotopy. And here you multiply. So here we have multiplication of Gerholms. Here you have multiplication of Gerholms. Where are you landed? You are landed to Gerholm 1, 4. And here we take a homology. So this is Messi operation. You see, it looks a bit complicated. Canonical, but complicated. Uh, isn't it just a uh, homotopy perturbation formula for three? Well, of yes. Of course. It is just homotopy okay. perturbation formula. 
When you have multiplicates, not homotopy. Thank you. So once uh, we with Garadensov did this computation explicitly and it took some time. All steps are trivial, but sometimes when you are making computation, sometimes you are missing something, making <laughs> elementary mistakes. So after we corrected all mistakes, we of course got the, the correct result. But it's not uh, that you will do in uh, 15 minutes. So if you would like to avoid all mistakes, it will, this computation takes like one hour. If you do it for the first time. Uh, is it just because of science or there's something more to this? You are typically solving, you see, you have vector spaces, you are uh, taking kernels and co-kernels. When yes. you do this, sometimes you are <laughs> making elementary mistakes. So mm -hmm. I know it uh, from experience. So if you will not do elementary mistakes in taking kernels and co-kernels, so you see, if somebody is doing this, uh, for several months, one can do it maybe in 10 uh, minutes. But if you do it for the first time, it will take you one hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, here uh, there's a tricky point that uh, things could be singular if there is uh, M2. Mm. What do you mean singular? So, so uh, as always, if you have, uh, if you do have uh, multiplication. And so then singular is just uh, not, not uniquely defined, I mean, it's defined up to isomorphisms of the structure. Right? Yes. So it is, so it is, it is not canonically defined and formula does not uh, go uh, nicely. So, uh, so if you look what is going on. You will just see that things would not go nicely if A uh, equals to B. Because in this case, in the product, mm -hmm. so in, in this case, in some products, you would have uh, um, M2 operations. Well, you're saying that, that uh, you need to say something about the inverse. You need to fix uh, the ah, So it, it doesn't matter. The choice of D inverse. Is it your choice? Your choice, the inverse. So when you do computation, you see that uh, you might choose several D inverses because to take to take D inverse means uh, sometimes to take representative in the coset, like higher vector space projector to lower dimensional vector space, you need to, to pick some arbitrary section. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so, uh, so it's an exercise, you know, like, like running. So if you run every day, uh, it will be easy to run. If you like me would not run, it would take time. But it depends uh, how much do you want to compute this rational number. Mm -hmm. And as a result, all the choices goes away. And you have this nice formula. So once again, when A, B, just 
thing about about M two. It's that if you have A and B different, and here you here we have a map from A to some O and from O to some B, whatever this would mean. If you consider composition, the composition would be something like maps from skyscraper at A at A to skyscraper at B. Mm -hmm. From a naive idea, you may think that, that it is zero. So it would mean that there will be no homology in the product. So when A and B are different, however, when A and B are the same, the risk of homology in the product, and uh, that's why you have some irregularity when A equals to B. And that's why, and you may see that it is the only irregularity. So, the M3 operation, just from the computation, you can probably prove it, is regular on CP1 times CP1 minus diagonal. And this uh, mostly determines its, its particular form. So you may expect poles of different orders, but uh, maybe one can explain without computation that the pole has to be of the first order. And that's why after you compute, compute, compute something, you are getting this. 1 over a minus b. So I cheated you a bit, you see, because 1 over a minus b sounds uh, non-natural. It is something on c or c cross c. But I told you it's on cp1 times cp1. So actually, it's, of course, a meromorphic section of some bundle. Okay, knowing this bundle, you may check that uh, that the only degree could be the first order pole. So you can either compute it or make a clever guess that there is nothing but this that you can get. It's interesting. By the way, this, comp this computation is not presented as a Polishuk paper, okay? Unfortunately. And uh, so it would be at some exercise uh, book on homological algebra, but uh, I don't no, I know. Think, I, I think uh, Retach was doing something very similar. So every, I say, Everybody is doing this. Mm -hmm. So I think that this computation was reproduced by different people like hundreds of times. But mm -hmm. all students who are doing homological algebra, so professor goes and says, compute this because it's the simplest, interesting Massey operation. It's actually simple. If you go to original Massey, he says that operation is defined only if uh, there is no uh, product of products on cohomology. If you go to original definition of Massey operation. Okay, so we have this nice operation. Moreover, it's an operation where 
on the moduli space of objects, actually on the square of moduli space of objects. Just imagine that we do polynomials and we know nothing but polynomials. Never heard about rational functions, okay? Pasha, just imagine. Um. Then we never heard about rational functions. You see, everything here were polynomials. We never heard about localization. Just imagine, it's a game. Then after you compute M3, you say that on the square of moduli uh, of objects of type OA, you have this operation. And you say, look, this is something new. I have something new, very mm. new type of, of function. Wait a second. So your A and B, they are parameters of objects, and um, but you are supposed to feed in what some morphisms as, as inputs of your M3 operation. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Oh, the, the, these morphisms are what dimensional spaces. Okay, so you have some preferred basis in your space yes. of in your line of objects, I see. And uh, you're comparing the output to also the preferred basis and the coefficient yes. is a number. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I said to you that you will make some mistakes, you will definitely make a mistake in, uh, in the realization of the of the cohomology because it's cohomology. Yeah. These are the spaces, you see. So that's why it will take you some time. But when you do this, you say, hey, I got something. And it means, it means that collection of objects that you got from, from the god collection of objects is equipped with a function. And then you can construct all ring of function in this way. This is uh, this is the bridge between the old approach to manifold. So old, in old approach to manifold, manifolds were considered as a spectrum of a ring or uh, something related to the field, okay? In the new way of thinking, you start with the moduli space of objects. But when you have this moduli space of objects, you may think that there is no topology there. Okay? Yeah. You would like to have something like the risky topology or something. You need some, some structure on this set because moduli space of uh, say all A's, all B's are, are what? The, uh, the, they are sets with no topology. So topology is given by functions. And then how can we get the functions other than uh, delta functions that are not interested? You are getting these functions studying this Massey operation. So that's how uh, functions come back. And this is the modern point of view on what manifold is. Manifold is the moduli space of, uh, of uh, objects in uh, differential graded category. Equipped with, you have analog of the ring, 
of functions with this higher uh, operation. I'm not sure I That's understand. I, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, ideological words, but I still don't understand in this example because I, I'm getting a function on configuration space of two points, not somehow it yeah. on, yes. on yes. two so points. You, so yeah. you consider this. You consider this as a function on CP one that depends on the, a second point as a parameter. Mm. Okay, so, so this was a bit of philosophy, very important formula, and this formula satisfies this A infinity relation. And basically, this was a way how to get it. Mm -hmm. And this way to get it is called B model. You get meromorphic function. Now, let me make much more tractable. I, and, and also, you can check that it satisfies this relation. In order to prove it directly, I mean, from construction, you need to, to consider even bigger space. Mm -hmm. yes. You need to consider six objects. Mm -hmm. Consider different massives, factorization, etc. Now, I will tell you another model that is that is an A model. But uh, in this construction, it looked like you could uh, have uh, just some even chain of objects. So. Uh, I mean, have even number of points on the disk with the same story, no? Uh, so actually, so you, you might see that actually no. And uh, there is a good reason for this. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is that the resolvent that we used was algebraic resolvent. Yeah. Everything was purely algebraic, right? Yes. And we got meromorphic function on the modular space of objects. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we were working only with polynomials of Z, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Only homogeneous polynomials. So only graded rings were used. Mm -hmm. Purely algebraic. You can do it on uh, almost any field. Not necessarily. Yeah, I, I, are you saying that uh, uh, like Higher massy operations they vanish by some degrees, and or what? What are yes. you saying? They they vanish because uh, so there is algebraic resolvent, mm -hmm. and there is also functional resolvent. Mm -hmm. In functional resolvent, you do things differently. You consider uh, bundles, of course, but now you consider them as a smooth bundles yeah. with the chain classes. And you equipped and you equip everything with the complex structure. Mm -hmm. you, you also have morphisms, okay? But now, the only operation that you will have everywhere would be D-bar. It, it could be called D-bar resolver. So you embed everything into smooth category. Mm -hmm. And after you build up this, so I have not done it, but uh, it is almost clear how to do it. 
-hmm. You would also compute this operation. However, there will be only d, d bar minus one. And here, it would be clear that when you are working on the smooth manifold, you can use this d bar only once, minus one only once. Mm -hmm. Because uh, CP1 has a dimension. So this dimension also shows up in resolvents. So there are some famous theorems about how the length of resolvents of different objects is related to dimension of the manifold. Mm -hmm. So this uh, argument uh, could be used uh, also, but uh, for, for a person who, pro who probably prefers a smooth consideration, mm -hmm. Uh, this is easier. You just believe that uh, everything could be written in terms of smooth functions at the bar acting there. Mm -hmm. And then you can easy, easily see that the, that the depth would be only one. Now, you may also ask the following important question or interesting question. How can one prove that uh, answers are the same? Actually, by taking a double resolvent, okay? So, when you have resolvent one and resolvent two, you sometimes can take, I think it's a product of resolvents by complex. One resolvent like this, another resolvent like this. But so, so sorry, when you're talking about resolving, uh, what for? For the skyscraper or, or for, for what? For everything. Everything. You need to represent skyscraper, you need to represent maps. Mm -hmm. You need to represent complexes of holomorphic uh, sections of the vector bundles by some other complexes. Mm -hmm. So actually in order to compare them, you consider a double resolvent. And you call it tic-tac-toe. And in this way, you prove that computing one way and computing another way gives you the same thing. So this is how to prove that the answer are the same. Another lesson from this formula. Imagine that you started with a D-bar resolvent, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you may think that you have some problem in differential geometry. Because the bar enters. And actually, many problems that you can have here would not have nice uh, solutions. However, if the problem that you are doing uh, is that you are treating using mean, using the bar resolvent is actually something that could be formulated using algebraic resolvent, the final result would be algebraic. So all the bar, all uh, this uh, analysis, all this calculus should disappear at the end. Mm -hmm. And you will get algebraic result. So it also answers uh, the question or illustrates the question that I like, suppose you are doing some problem in complex geometry with D bar. When you may expect to have a nice answer. And my project is, you will get nice answer only 
if you are computing the object or something that uh, could be computed using algebraic resolver because that's the result of the algebraic otherwise your probability to get some to get something nice and algebraic is zero because you are doing differential equations on sphere how could it be that, that as a result of all this procedure you will get something nice only if uh, you are computing something very particular okay Okay, so this, so that's what I said about about how one can compute this one over a minus b. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I'll compute uh, trigonometric analog of this, and computation would be much simpler. Okay. Because I will do Fukaya version. So now I will. So maybe we will make a five minute break. Pasha. No, yeah, sure, sure, of course. But only five minutes break. Because I don't okay. want to keep you mm -hmm. okay. too long. Okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right.
Ok. Five minutes have passed. Right, okay. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before I'll uh, do the A side, mm -hmm. I would like to, to make more commands. You see, we did it on uh, CPU1. However, there could be question how to do it say in dimension one on the gene of g riemann surface mm -hmm. how to do it algebraically so we should know how to replace polynomials okay of a fixed degree and there is a known uh, answer. And uh, the person who pushed for this answer in a way that uh, everybody else could read it and use it was uh, Mumford. And uh, you would hardly get, uh, you, you could hardly think that uh, such a mathematician could, provo could propose this answer. So Mumford answer was that these polynomials are nothing but the holomorphic sections of the line bundle. So polynomial of degree K is the holomorphic section of line bundle. So we need, so here uh, we can control them. It's very easy. Of course, you can go to higher projective spaces in this way and get something. Easy to go to toric manifolds. No this. However, the question, another question is what to do for Riemann surfaces. So for Riemann surfaces, it's better to have similarly effective uh, theory of sections of line bundle. And uh, this theory is uh, given by Theta function theory. So 
that's it you use it you construct algebraic you construct algebraic resolver using this that's why David Mumford specifically wrote a book explaining how to have in some sense constructive theory of uh, holomorphic sections of line bundles such that you can multiply them such that you can solve equations that you need to solve in order to construct uh, resolvent for skyscraper etc so for genus one it is exactly the theta function for genus g you study theta function so theta function depends on the matrix tau and uh, on the vector z g dimensional and this is also g times g dimensional something so you use it however you put tau the period matrix of the Riemann surface and as z you put period integral from point point p0 to p so theta actually is a function on jacobian but uh, this i believe jacobi map embeds Riemann surface to Jacobian like this so in order to compute something you need to read David Manford book Tata lectures on theta functions if you actually want to compute something and uh, the analog of relation for m3 is called phase identity and this is already mentioned in the polishuk's paper however without uh, detailed derivation okay so after uh, so with this I finish general philosophy about uh, B model one can always by the way one can always make computation in genus one because in genus one you can work directly with D bar. And now another computation. It would be A side. Mm -hmm. I would consider. infinitely long cylinder C star and I'll equip C star with the standard on C star symplectic form dr d phi so r is going in this direction and phi is going in this direction now once again i want to have m3s so i need 
And I, I don't actually know how much of something I need. But to get M3, I definitely need four objects. So I'd like to have four Lagrangian submanifolds. So in this dimension two, all uh, one dimensional submanifolds are Lagrangian. But I'd like to take particular. Two vertical lines and two horizontal lines. Now, as before, I will write L1, L2, L3, L4, and I will start counting holomorphic disks. Okay? That are bounded on these L's. So objects are Lagrangian submanifolds. Morphisms are intersection points. Here there are four of them. And now I'd like to see how many, so how many ways the disk could be holomorphically mapped to the cylinder such that Lagrangian Submanifolds go to Lagrangian submanifolds and uh, intersection points go to intersection points. And I, and I am going to weight it. So each map is weighted with e to the symplectic area. Okay. Phi of disk. By the way, so this was Fukai definition. At some moment, uh, Karsevich came in and made some improvement. He said, you can also have a local system of Lagrangian manifold. So if you have a local system and if you have this piece, you can pull back local system and take transition matrix, okay, from point to point. And then you multiply the result by the product of uh, four transition matrices. So, Connection here. So one connection is taken from this place, another connection from this place, etc. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, this would be M3. So, and, and I'm just trying to remember, so uh, when you, you say that um, for the intersection, uh, I mean, for the, for the home between two objects, you, you take intersection points, but actually, I mean, actually you, you get a complex, which is sort of generated by intersection points with some differential. Yes, but uh, however, in this particular case, there is no Yeah, you get only one. Yeah, here you have only one intersection point, sure. 
Actually, if Lagrangians do not do not intersect transversely, you get infinite dimensional complex of cycles. No, but even if they do inter intersect transversely, just in several points, then you have so this yes. intersection points yes. in different degrees, right? You have different degrees, you have differential. Mm -hmm. But differential is operation M1. And differential also counts holomorphic disks, just, yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. here we don't have it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You see here, uh, the space of morphisms is one dimensional, mm -hmm. like, like before. Okay, so then the question is, what is the space of holomorphic maps? So one can easily find one. Donald, could you find, find another holomorphic map? Maybe the one just going the other way? Like the other way, we would give wrong orientation. Induced orientation would be wrong. Hmm. So direction could be the same. Okay. Yes, it's not holomorphic, right? Yes. If if I do go this way, it would not be holomorphic. Mm -hmm. No, no, what I meant, sorry, what I meant is still the same direction, but like going around the the cylinder. Yes. This one I meant. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you can you can just keep stopping. So this interval. Mm -hmm. evolutes a long file. It could stop here and nobody could uh, complain. However, it could also go all the way around and then stop here. Mm -hmm. Or you can go several times. Mm -hmm. And that's all. So consider this difference, R0. Consider this, phi0. Now let us see what we will get. We would always get contribution from this square. And then we will get one plus e to the minus r zero plus e to the minus two r zero plus etc. Mm -hmm. What a nice sum. Now, just see, there could be a local system and there would be some phase because of it. The contribution from the local system, if you wrap all the way around, would be minus A1 plus A1 minus A2 with the I. So what does it mean A1 and A2? Just consider connection on these circular Lagrangian manifolds. 
to A1 D5 connection here, A2 D5 connection here. So, okay, phi is say two pi, I, I don't care. But that's what we will get. Well, that's it. Here we'll have no algebra, pure geometry. Could we sum it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a progression. You may even do it better if you say that this R0 is R1 minus R2. So this is R1, position of upper Lagrangian submanifold. And this is R2. Okay. And now let us introduce Z. Oh, maybe A or Z. Okay, A. A1 and A2 e to the minus R2 plus 2 pi i. A2. Okay. Then all this complicated sum would be equal to. That's it. It's a theory with a trigonometric pole. Note that I1 and I2 are two complex numbers. Actually, as you can see, these A1 and A2 are two points on C star. This C star is called dual C star. And the result is like this. <coughs> Voila. Now, there is an exercise to check that these things satisfy three term relation. or to derive this three term relation from from the holomorphic coverings. You may forget this resummation and you may just think what happens on the space of holomorphic coverings? In the particular case, when we have three vertical lines, three horizontal lines. So, 
it would be an exercise to prove. But here, it is here, but here we have the value of this operation. We have the same pole structure. However, here pole is something that comes from multiple rapidness. Now, yes, I'd like to finish very soon. So okay. uh, I, I, I'm vaguely recalling that there was some, uh, uh, well, paper by Polishuk and Zaslow where there was the same computation, I think, but, but for genus one. I'm sorry, not by Polishuk and Zaslow, by Polishuk no? one. Ah, okay. Because when Polishuk worked with Zaslov, mm -hmm. they wrote a paper explaining uh, what are the X, what are objects, X, etc. I thought it was just a, like, yeah, a simple example of homological mirror symmetry, where one side was the, the, well, yes. this, exactly this yes. count, but for uh, torus. Yes, so, so you can do, yes, you can do it. Yes, you, you, of course you can do it for a torus, yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, however, now we can do a bit better. We can make a torus and have double counting. Mm -hmm. However, here we can do another thing. we can add a cup. So when we add the cup, mm -hmm. we should uh, intersect Lagrangian manifolds there. And it will be also possible to use, uh, uh, you see, to go through cap. And uh, it would bring uh, corrections to the business. So you can say that the area of this cap is S1. You can add the cap downside, downside with the area S2. And play, and play the same games. I'm afraid that now in that case you see the holomorphic triangle upside and downside and then M2 does not vanish and it will give you a serious change on the whole picture, isn't it? So uh, now, now, the matter is if your map goes downstairs and upstairs, so you can, you can actually treat it perturbatively. It's, it's your, your choice. You can, you can try to treat it perturbatively. Perturbative treatment means that you consider e to the minus s1 and e to the minus s2 as formal variables. So, but isn't it the first assumption, assumption was the vanishing of M1 and M2. That's yes, what I'm yes. talking about. Yes, so in yes, the, in the, but, but, yes uh, now, now when I'm adding cups, you see, I'm, uh, I'm just showing you, I am just showing the, how to generalize this example. Yes, of course. If you do this, 
you have uh, you have to make serious changes. It's true. And I'm not going to compute these changes. At least today. I'm just showing how to go from the cylinder to different places. But so what happens with vertical Lagrangians so that they continue to meet at the tip, tip of a cup? Somehow. So in that case, you're considering a great circle on a sphere? Yes. Right? And to my knowledge, all great circle on a sphere are equivalent as an object inside of a category. Because, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but in the end, you will end up with the equivalent object. And now you can see the strips and triangles and so on. So it seems does not fit to our initial assumption. This is kind of what, what I'm worrying about. But... Yeah. You see, uh, here, here, uh, here, I just, here I'm just trying to make command. I'm not going to work out this example right now. I'm showing I how, how, to, how to work it out if needed. And here uh, there is a command because e to the minus s1 would be considered either as a number such that you can invert it or as a formal variable. So, and uh, in, in principle, there could be differences. I see. And uh, the very last thing is that you can uh, tensor to a infinity structure. Without thinking about disks, you can tensor them as to homological field theories over the modular space of uh, of points uh, on the boundary of the disk. It's all it, it's also doable, and this would correspond to tensor product of two uh, a infinities. So I so what what I actually wanted to show today is uh, this side of the story. Okay. But um, I want to ask about this. So when, when Polishuk first studied this square tiled surface, I would say, he considered uh, some sort of version of young baxter equation and their solutions. And he found a lot of solutions from this uh, typically uh, so specific configurations of Lagrangians on the torus and uh, various surface. So, but if you cap this surface, uh, I don't think they gives you uh, solutions of the equation that he uh, first considered. Is is that right, or does it gives you a, another sort of solution? Uh, you see, you see, I think that if you consider this s one s two as not formal but uh, invertible, you would get rational solution. Ah, so sphere gives you rational solutions of no. that equation. Sorry. I see. Uh, no, it's, it's my it's my mistake. It would not give rational solutions. I'm sorry. Rational solutions on the B side, and and with the sphere you would get solution with superpotential, and uh, it will be a different story. Ah, so uh, if you do the B side story on a sphere, you get a rational solutions. Yeah. Okay, so okay, uh, mirror, to, mirror to the uh, cylinder is a cylinder. That's why you have this pole. However, if you cap it on the A side, on the B side, it will be, it will give super potential, but that's, that's what you know. That's what I don't want to go in right now. Okay, I see, thank you. Because uh, Dong, so you, you were starting it, and for the rest of people, it's kind of introduction. So, so they see it for the first time. Most. No, no, no. But, it's good to see once again, <laughs> once again, this picture because 
uh, no calculus. I kind of very sloppy about ex explicit calculations. Uh, the other thing is I never really understand the Polishuk's original intention. Where does this young extra equation comes from? So what kind of physics behind those equations? I really don't know what he did in that context. So it probably, not, yeah. I thought it was not young Baxter here. You see, okay. Now, now I am guessing. Okay. Uh, so my guess, my guess is that if you move the Lagrangian some manifolds, you will get something like young Baxter. But uh, I am not sure. So after all, his intention, his intention, was to compute a to compute infinity structure. Because uh, it's an open side of mirror story. So uh, the theory is defined not only by space of cohomology and not only by uh, multiplication cohomology. There is additional data in the theory that is captured by higher operations. In the cloud sector, it is called, uh, okay, you might say theory of primitive form. So you actually need to do this in order to capture uh, the data of what is going on. So okay. here, I see. so here we need to study a infinity structures up to equivalences. And uh, you see, the goal of my today's talk was to show you, to show everybody, appearance of a infinity in such way that it's clear that uh, there is no way to move it. So what I am interested in, I have very specific question. I am interested in uh, fluctuations around this A infinity. So you see A infinity that starts with M3 is kind of special. So we know that fluctuations around A infinity that starts with M2 is also special because it gives uh, Hochschild cohomology. Sorry, it always gives Hochschild cohomology, but if you do it around uh, M2 that is commutative and associative, you get polyvector fields, so it's a nice structure. So I have a general question where I don't have uh, a nice answer. So these M3s look uh, very preferred, very simple. So what can we say about Hochschild cohomology around them? They also should have some uh, geometrical meaning. So basically, it's, it, basically, this was my question. So are you suggesting that the Hochschild cohomology computed by these configurations of Lagrangian for vector bundles on each model gives you yes. a, yes. a non-trivial no, uh, operation other than multiplication on the polyvectors? Yes, yeah, so, so, so here, so here uh, in this sector, I see only uh, A infinity structure at the level of M3. So uh, there should be something specific about it. Okay, thank you. So I, I, I'm interested what, what it is. Because I feel that these M3s are kind of special. 
in this particular uh, case. So actually, the question is, what could be the generalization of uh, Hochschild constant Rosenberg theory? So Hochschild cohomology over the commutative space is something special. So here it is what? So it, it is also like a space. But uh, it's a space of uh, non gross and dick type. It means no M2 at all. But still, it is a space. So, what is it? Yeah, that sounds very interesting. I should try that one by myself. Thank you. But 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 this is too philosophical, you know. It's, uh, I mean, this question. But I feel that there is something special in, the, in this class of infinity structures. So they are too simple. Okay. Okay. So I think it's enough for today. All right. Pasha, so it, it was like two hours with five minutes break. Mm -hmm. And now uh, I think that on Wednesdays we should work only for two hours and not for three hours. Because it's too uh, early for, uh, okay, too late for you. We have two pi. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, okay. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So by the way, Pasha, we will meet today at uh, a time that we yes, fixed. and 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 Donald also, yeah, mm -hmm. so, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I I have not yet talked to Donald, but mm -hmm. Donald, you are invited. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Don't Back to Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Then. Um, wait. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, see you later then. Okay, see you later. Thanks. Thank you for the lectures and see you tomorrow. <laughs>